Hello and welcome to yet another recall session of INICT. This is the ninth of the recall sessions that we are actually doing. I still remember the first of the recall sessions I did at home for 2020 uh, May exam and we were all sitting at home because of COVID. So after that, we've had uh, two exams in 20, then 21, 22, 23, and this is the first of our exams in 24. So I think got an experience of approximately nine exams. Every time what we have generally seen is the November exam tends to mirror the May exam. So it's almost like similar. So people who are attempting the November exam for them, this recall is mighty important. But otherwise, a May exam does bring in a lot of surprises. We've had bounces every time in May. But this time around, I'm actually speaking very happily for the board putting the exam because we, I, I have always told you that these differences do exist because we have three institutes, you know, PGI, AIMS and Chukmar. So the question paper is being set by different institutes, different times, but most often by AIMS. But this time around, uh, it's it's a different kind of a paper, a paper which is very unique because we've not had papers like this before in INI. Not because of the degree of toughness, no, it's not at all tough. It's not because of the degree of complexity, no, absolutely not. It's not checking your depth of knowledge, no, not at all. But it is just trying to check out whether you have common sense or whether you are able to apply or execute what you have learned. And that is where I think there is a real difference between some of the students who are able to apply properly what they have learned and a few of them who have not been able to apply what they have learned. So this is uh, in stark contrast to the eight exams that we have done recall prior to. If you can actually see those eight recalls, I think it's very evident also. So I am pretty happy for that because this is exactly what you need to test from the student rather than asking him where is CD45 located on. So that's like just testing out his memory. Here, there have been absolutely nothing with respect to memory. You can just watch all the videos very lavishly at your own pace, just developing a core understanding. The soul of the topic, you are, if, if you are able to get it, then that's like sealing the job for you. And once again, this exam is so lopsided in the sense that it is giving a big advantage to people who are just fresh from their internship because there are a lot of questions inside this, which if you are an intern, by default, you'll be able to answer. You need no coaching, no notes, no videos to answer those questions. So definitely in favor of them. And for the others who have finished their internship and it's been quite a gap, they might err on these very basic things. And that's again something that makes this exam very special. So for the first time, I believe, in the history of INA exams, and at least the nine recalls that I have done, because this exam started uh, from 2020. Before that, we had separate exams for PGIMs and Jibman. So for the first time, that they're really testing out on common sense. And common sense is something which I have generally not talked about much in my videos because uh, I, I am not exactly sure as to what is this common sense because common sense is defined by different people in different ways. So what might seem very simple for me might seem a little tough for you and may not seem actually as common sense to you. But whatever said and done, let's start off with this. And uh, again, keeping in mind that knowledge counts, but for this particular exam, I think the statement is so, 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 so right. And that is that knowledge does count, but common sense matters. Uh, now, I'm not just, I'm not going to take you to each and every question and discuss all the, uh, what do you say, the data with respect to that question and what can be the answer and what cannot be the answer, etc, etc. I just navigate through the entire pro the entire set of questions that we do have and just take you through the strategies that you need to develop with respect to the coming number INA and it's for that cohort that this particular discussion is going to be of use. Generally, in terms of INI, we have always said that the three core chapters that we need also are endocrine, nephrology and hematology. So these are the three main chapters like the must to do, must to know, the most important pivotal chapters. So this time around also, the bulk of the questions have actually come from there. I9 does tend to add on specific areas from the other chapters. Their uh, neurology is definitely very weak in the sense that they ask maximum one or two questions. Sometimes they don't even ask anything from neurology. Cardiology is always an ECG game. So it's always an ECG game and questions which are theory questions based on the ECG is what they generally ask. And this time around also, this is the same. Clinical exam papers will have a lot of questions in rheumatology. So this time around, it's not so much a clinical exam paper. So rheumatology has only one or two. And as always, uh, pulmonology questions are far and few. Gastro questions are far and few. Liver questions are far and few. And liver questions always tend to be around hepatitis B. So this is generally been the pattern. Uh, all these exams we have seen. And this time also, the same pattern is being kept. And again, these are the core areas. But the questions are a little tricky. So let us start off with the king subject for any entrance exam. And that is uh, endocrine. So was it a bouncer? Absolutely not. It is not a bouncer. Does the depth of knowledge matter? No. PYQ strategy, useless because there were hardly any PYQs. It's about whether you're able to apply the basics that you have studied. It's as simple as that. Why am I not able to cross the bar? Because my execution is somewhere not that at its best or 
when I think of the question, I'm probably going into that page in my notebook or page in my notes or textbook or whatever that I have read. But rather that idea is not being formed. If that idea is being formed, then I can easily come to the answer because there are hardly any tough questions in this paper. So again, um, like crime thrillers, a lot of twists in this paper, right? It's like you have basic questions which are being twisted here and there and answers are quite related because of that. So if you have the exact question only, I can give you the exact answer. So the questions that we have deciphered are not exact. So that's why options may change one or two here and there. Don't worry about that. Just see whether your thought process is in the right direction. So once again, reiterating the concepts and reiterating the core zones as far as the exam is concerned. Let's go to the first of the chapters, which is endocrinology and metabolism. Big share, 13 questions in fact. And in fact, if you dig deep into physiology and anatomy, you have even more questions. So 13 questions that I could actually assimilate. So that's a big number out of 200 questions. Let us see. So twist in the tail, five questions, easy seven questions and difficult one question. This is what I feel. So without wasting time, let us go into the first of the questions. Which of the following is not a diagnostic criteria for diabetic ketosis? So acute complications of diabetes is a much worse, I mean, must watch module. Every time we've had questions on that. So the moral of the story is DK, HHS are like, not just like watching casually, but you need to have a strong grip. And this is one area where interns can outsmart these guys who actually finished their internship quite some time back because of the simple reason that they will be seeing a lot of DK by themselves. So they need not even study to answer this. So very basic question, pH less than 7.3. So definitely DK means you are having acidosis, you are having hyperglycemia. And of course, bicarb is also less than 15. So even I think LKG student will be able to answer this. Only wrong answer here is potassium less than 3.5. So this is exactly trying to test a very basic concept as a concept our seniors or our PGs tell us when we are interns. That means that once you start correcting with insulin for DK, there is every chance that potassium will go into the cell. And if you don't replace potassium adequately when you are giving fluids for a patient with DK, tomorrow patient's DK will improve but patient will not move his limbs. So that's very, very important. And pivotal to actually correct potassium alongside with correcting DK with fluids as well as with uh, insulin. So the basic take home message is that potassium correction is mandatory alongside with insulin when you treat a patient with DK. But what does DK lead on to means DK actually leads on to hyperkalemia. Lot of H plus ions in your system, H plus ions will move into the cell in response to that K plus ions will come out of the cell into the blood and you are having hyperkalemia. This hyperkalemia, not significant hyperkalemia, but potassium will increase in a patient DK. Once you start giving insulin, then this potassium will move into the cell in bigger numbers. That's the reason for dip in potassium. It's a very basic concept. You will not even actually learn it somewhere from the book. It's something that comes to our system naturally because we see a lot of patients like this. So this is question number one. No twist in the tail here, very basic. But the message is very clear that you have to be very, very, very thorough with this one particular aspect of diabetes for ANI. In all these exams, we have been actually able to get questions on DK, HHS, comparison between DK and HHS, and also those acute emergencies with respect to diabetes. Most importantly, these two emergencies, that is DK and hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma or hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, what we call as HHS. Let us go to question number two. So a diabetic patient complains of breathlessness on lying down, walking uphill, echo shows ejection fraction of 40%. Uh, and he has got a fasting glucose of 135, BP slightly high, HbA1c 7.8, Hb13, a lot of data given, but let us go to the important data. Which of the following anti-diabetic drugs can be used for this patient? So essentially, this is a question of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Once again, trying to highlight the importance of this topic. It's a very much repeat question because heart failure questions have been asked left, right and center. Focus on pharmacotherapy of heart failure. I have done a module on that. Ranjan sir has done a module on that. You can watch either of the two, but it's very, very important. Pharmacotherapy of heart failure should be at your fingertips. And what does pharmacotherapy of heart failure tell us in a nutshell? It tells us that it tells us the story of the Fantastic Four. Yes, the Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four starting off with beta blockers, which have the maximum mortality benefit. And the beta blockers which are used in heart failure are metoprolol, bisoprolol, carbidolol, what we call as the MBC drugs. The second group, which includes ARNI, and ARNI is the main one. If not ARNI, then ACE inhibitor. If not ACE inhibitor, then only ARB. So the second among the Fantastic Four is ARNI, and we have discussed in detail about sacubitril velsartan combination. The third one is, of course, your aldosterone receptor blocker or your aldosterone antagonist which is your spironolactone or epilirinol. And the fourth one is your SDLT2 inhibitor. So these are the four drugs, what we call as fantastic four in heart failure. Their role in HFREF or reduced ejection fraction has been proven beyond doubt, but their role in HPF is not proven beyond doubt. 
Anyway, so this is 40% anti-diabetic drug used in this patient with heart failure very clearly is, of course, dapagliflozin. So there are lots and lots of trials which have been done in this regard, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. Now, my only worry with respect to this question, which is not a problem for the student because I think nobody else would have, nobody would have got this question wrong, is liraglutide is actually a drug which has cardiac benefits in a patient with diabetes. So, if you ask me, is liraglutide useful for a patient with diabetes who has some form of heart disease? Definitely. A very much favorite, favorite study, you know, PG, PG times they ask you this, it's a study called LEADER or a trial called LEADER. And LEADER has actually come to the conclusion that liraglutide does benefit people with heart disease. And now the onus you can see in addition we have done a module on treatment for diabetes in 2024 how is it different is that the onus is on treating the comorbidities more than diabetes per se so drugs which have additional benefits are rolling the roost so definitely liraglutide is a drug you can consider 100 percent you can consider but in this particular question i'm not asking you to mark liraglutide simply because of the reason that the first to four frontline drugs for patients with heart failure are these four and more so when you are a diabetic definitely it has 100 percent 100 percent value Okay, so SCD2 is recommended. It's a very, very high level of recommendation. Cardiovascular benefits of GLP-1 receptor agonist, what we call as liraglutide. Okay, it's cardiovascular benefits of what we call as GLP-1 receptor analog, that is liraglutide as well as the newer one, that is oral semaglutide. I've again been discussed in detail. Just have a look at that. So that's why they, they're good with respect to the heart. I'm not saying they're the first line, front line, etc. But they're definitely good with respect to the heart. So please go back and watch this in detail. Again, we've done a module on diabetic kidney disease where I mentioned with respect to each GFR, which are the best drugs, best options, best options, best options. So obviously the two best options are GLP-1 RA and SCLT2 inhibitors. Obviously the best option is always SCLT2 inhibitors. Another add-on pharmacology question, what increases the risk of urinary tract infection and dapagliflozin? This has been asked so many times. Please keep in mind with DAPA, three things can come as potential questions as far as side effects is concerned. You are having glycosuria. Glycosuria can increase the risk for UTI, especially mycotic UTI. And then, of course, this euglycemic uh, ketosis, which is again a favorite question. Then you're losing phosphorus and that can lead on to bone disease. So basically, these three things can come as options. Again, something which Ranjan has taught you, I have taught you. Intermittent administration of teriparatide predisposes an individual to which of the following complications. The question on osteoporosis, I have actually ensured that I have released this module on osteoporosis because uh, it's a very short module and you can actually see the management of osteoporosis. So we focus a lot on these anabolic drugs and among the anabolic drugs we have teriparatide also. But now, even if you don't know this, osteonecrosis of jawbone is a classical side effect of bisphosphonate, yes. Atypical fractures, atypical side fractures can occur with bisphosphonates. Net loss of bone mass, definitely you are giving something to increase the bone mass. Osteosarcoma is not a proven thing, but again Abbas has discussed this. Uh, and even in pharmacology we are taught this, that these drugs, there are animal studies showing that they can produce malignancy. Though they are not expecting you to know that. They just want you to know that the other options are not possible. Atypical side fractures can occur with bisphosphonates, collapsing epistasis can occur with bisphosphonates. Esophagitis can occur with bisphosphonates, osteonecrosis of the jawbone can occur with bisphosphonates, teriparatide is not going to produce any of these things. So that's why if you eliminate also, you can come to the answer. Otherwise, if you have done your orthopedics properly also, you can answer. Which of the following anti-diabetic drug can be, I mean, can cause unexplained diarrhea? This is not an easy question. This is definitely very tricky and uh, something which uh, majority people have gone wrong with because uh, the commonest drug that we use in this uh, particular group is metformin. But how common is metformin producing diarrhea? I have prescribed metformin and I can't even count the number of times we give metformin. Um, I'm not sure. Like metformin producing diarrhea is something that we don't see routinely in practice. So when I con was confronted with this question, I seriously was confused because if you read the textbook, definitely all of them can produce diarrhea. It's like you go and sit in the pharmacology viva and you're asked what is the side effect of any drug you say vomiting nausea nausea vomiting so same thing applies here also but uh, that uh, in terms of this naturally not coming to mind so of course we have to go into some uh, what do you say studies and they have actually told us about a drug detailing what we call no in terms of your most up-to-date knowledge on the drug and in that you can see common side effects as diarrhea so citagliptin also produces diarrhea, but again, when we discuss with pharmacology people, they are also under the impression that definitely pyoglitazone is not something that produces diarrhea. Sulfonylureas and diarrhea are not a common proposition. Metformin, I know, can produce nausea, can produce some degree of a change in your taste, but not rent of diarrhea so much. 
But when you look at data, citagliptin and metformin can produce diarrhea. And different studies have shown that, or which more commonly associated with diarrhea is metformin. So this is a question which is a fluke. If you get it right, you get it right. But otherwise, not an easy question. So we have had so many easy questions till now. This one is definitely not that way. Patient complains of recurrent kidney stones, abdominal pain, altered mentation. This, I don't know whether this is the original question. I kept on asking uh, to many students in so many groups as to whether this is the actual question. Because this question's clinical data and the biochemical data are not tallying. Let's see. So recurrent stones, abdominal pain and altered mentation are going with your bones, stones, abdominal groans and fatigue overtones. Now what we study in hypercalcemia. So they've given a clinical picture of hypercalcemia in this patient. You, I think you remember, right? We have discussed this so many times. So, uh, renal stones, abdominal groans, psychotic mounts, painful bones, and fatigue overtones. That's what we talk about, hypercalcemia. So many times we have talked about hypercalcemia like that. But this particular explanation is that of hypercalcemia. And after giving an explanation or a clinical picture which looks like hypercalcemia, they have given a biochemical description of decreased calcium and elevated pH. So now, what do you do? So anyway, let's forget the clinical description now. Let's see decreased calcium and elevated pH. Now, whenever you are having increase in pH, you are expecting to have an increase in calcium. So increase in pH with increase in calcium is basically what we call as primary hyperparathyroidism, correct? Primary hyperparathyroidism, where you are having increase in calcium. So primary hyperparathyroidism, where you are having increase in calcium, decrease in phosphate and increase in pH. Calcium is such a vital topic, okay, bone mineral metabolism, please study in detail, in detail, everything is important inside that. Now, there is another entity called tertiary hyperparathyroidism, which you can see in CKD patients, where again you will have an increase in calcium, but increase in phosphate and increase in PTH. So, this is tertiary hyperpara, seen uniquely in CKD patients. Now, what remains is secondary hyperpara, which also you see in CKD patients, but in secondary hyperpara, there is decrease in calcium. And increase in pth because of that decrease in calcium and what is responsible for this decrease in calcium decrease in 125 dihydroxy d3 that is the reason for your decrease in calcium and this decrease in 125 dihydroxy d3 is because of what that is because of increase in fgf23 so increase in fgf23 inhibiting 1 alpha hydroxylase so decreased active vitamin d hence increase in uh, what is a decrease in calcium hence increase in pth this is called secondary hyperpara so this combination of decrease in calcium and increase in pth can be seen only in secondary hyperpara secondary hyperpara is classically seen with ckd what we call a ckd mineral bone disease or what you used to previously call as CKD renal osteodystrophy, now called, not now called, from 2017 onwards called as CKD mineral bone disease or bone mineral disease. In this particular question, hyperpara is wrong because calcium is low. Hypothyroidism is definitely wrong because hypothyroidism doesn't produce recurrent kidney stones, abdominal pain and all that. And hypothyroidism generally does produce hypocalcemia, that's why, but never hyperpara. Adrenal gland pheochromocytoma is a cause for hypercalcemia, not hypocalcemia. So, bone mineral disease is the answer. I think they're just trying to fox you here by giving you a completely odd clinical scenario. But decrease in calcium, increase in pH is equal to secondary hyperpara. If you know that, you are never going to err with respect to this question. So, again, once again, requesting you to go back and brush up on the basics with respect to calcium, phosphorus, bone. And of course, uh, do the module on hyper and hypopara. Which of the following causes a decrease in serum parathormone? Of course, the most important inhibitor of your parathyroid gland is vitamin D, which I think almost all of you know. And which vitamin D? The active form of vitamin D, what we call as 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol, or what we call as 125 dihydroxy D3, or what we actually call as calcitriol. Calcitriol is what that normally keeps a check on PTH. Again, I have discussed this under basics of bone mineral disease, the relationship between PTH and vitamin D. PTH stimulates vitamin D, but vitamin D goes and inhibits PTH. So that's why calcitriol is the answer to this question. You don't have to read anything else because none of the other options are going to make any kind of sense in this question. It is about what can inhibit PTH and definitely cal vitamin D is something that inhibits PTH, the active form of vitamin D. We have this one module on basics of hormones and mechanisms of action. One module that I have done as an introductory module. And you can actually see there are four questions or so that have come from that module. Amino acid derivative is hormones, which are actually speaking, peptide hormones, those, that, this, that, etc. And where we have discussed about tryptophan derivatives, tyros and derivatives, even that has come. Adenyl cyclase, cyclic AMB, protein kinase A, this question has also come on this uh, somatostatin growth hormone releasing hormone from the hypothalamus somatostatin inhibiting growth hormone releasing hormone stimulating ghrelin then stimulating all this has come zona glomerulosa fasciculata reticularis again in the adrenal cortex and then of course adrenal medulla hormones of the cortex hormones of the medulla all these questions have actually come 
okay so a lot of basic basic questions here and uh, apart from metformin that i think is a little difficult with respect to diarrhea all the other questions are things which if you have a level head sitting for the exam you will be able to answer a question on pediatrics again growth hormone has got no role in intrauterine growth that's a straight shot pick from what we have discussed which of the following is not seen in nutritional rickets again i think one of the most easiest questions that you can actually get in this whole paper low phosphorus normal or low calcium high pth of course and urine calcium creatinine ratio is something that you don't do in any context for that matter. Nowhere we're doing this. We do urine calcium for checking out for stones, martyrs, gentlemen, etc. We do. Essentially, you can watch it from Sikaram Studio. It's a very simple question. So don't miss on nutritional rickets, hypophosphatemic rickets, and vitamin D dependent rickets, and this table on how to differentiate. Another question on congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Again, very basic, very simple, and discussed in detail. Uh, you can see hypertension here, you can see precocious puberty over here. The moment you are having hypertension, you are alerted at about 17 and 11. This is a clear question, a uh, clear case of 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency. So 11 and uh, 21 are pretty similar, except for the fact that 21 doesn't have hypertension, 11 has hypertension. Again, discussed in detail by Singaram in his videos, and we have mentioned this at different points in time in our discussion on endocrine hypertension. You can actually watch that. But very basic knowledge, this again, nothing uh, complicated. Patient presents with trunkal obesity, abdominal stria, poor wound healing. What are the cause for the symptoms? It's basically hypercortisol. That's the first word in our discussion on Cushing. Now, the opening slide of Cushing itself is somebody who thinks he knows enough of Cushing hasn't seen enough, which means that Cushing is a very complicated disease. The most simplest idea you can get about Cushing is it is cortisol excess, what we call it, hypercortisolism. So, a lot of questions. In fact, um, more than 13 questions. Majority are easy. There are twists in the tail in a few questions and people who have been level-headed and know what is what. That's why I'm telling you, you can watch videos at a very relaxed pace. You need not actually be so stressed out. You should be stressed out with solving questions. When you're studying the question bank, you should be a little stressed out. And how to make your question bank learning easier is to basically watch videos. The more you watch videos and the more grounding you have on a topic, the more you know the soul of the topic, then this whole process of solving questions is going to be easy. Majority people try to mix up and do, which is a very wrong way. See, the question bank is designed in such a way that it is in sync with the videos. So if you're not thorough and then you're going to the question bank, then many a times there is going to be some kind of a difficulty. So this is the endocrine part of it. If you are somebody who has enjoyed the videos with respect to endocrine and has got a basic interest in endocrine, majority people have that because it's a beautiful medical subject. So of course, things are going to be easy. Let's see nephrology. Nephrology also quite a lot of questions this time. We start off with a controversial question, which again, I am not sure about. What is the least common cause for bipedal edema? So anyway, heart failure and CLD does produce bipedal edema. Chronic venous insufficiency, can it produce bipedal edema? Chronic venous insufficiency is the end result of a DVT. It's the end result of a varicose. Can you get bipedal edema? Yes, very much you can get bipedal edema in that. But most of the time it is unilateral. So it's unilateral more than bilateral and you can see it goes through different different stages and finally it can even have a venous ulcer this is a photo of a patient who has chronic venous insufficiency again you can see bipedal edema can lupus nephritis produce bipedal edema yeah man lupus nephritis uh, class 3 and class 4 class 1 and 2 are asymptomatic class 3 and 4 present is rp gen and rp gen is a glomerular disease typically characterized by what patient puffiness pedal edema and what about class 5 class 5 is membranous lupus how does it present it presents with nephrotic syndrome and what is nephrotic syndrome all about again full edema so lupus nephritis is classical um, although among the other glomerular disease it is less prone but still it can produce edema CLD heart failure can produce edema chronic venous insufficiency can also produce edema so actually all the four options are right but because chronic insufficiency is more unilateral than bilateral you are tempted to write it as chronic venous insufficiency but the margins are very less but these kind of questions are part and parcel of INA even if you get one or two of these questions wrong also no how okay then antibiotic use for fever and sore throat now presents with rash arthralgia use nephrology again if you get nephrology questions wrong i'll kick you because uh, not because i am a nephrologist but because these are the most elementary things if you have just slept and watched the video also you should be able to answer use nephrology is there rash is there arthralgia is there wbc cast is there so this is a ckd or not a ckd it is not a ckd it is mostly an acute event two to three weeks is what they have actually given so i'll probably put it as acute kidney injury or I can even put it as rapidly progressive renal failure. Either way, I can actually put it. Does the disease come under the vascular compartment, glomerular compartment, or the tubular interstitial compartment? No mention of hypertension. Let me strike off vascular. No 
mention of proteinuria, no mention of edema, no mention of RBC, let me strike off uh, glomerulus, let me come to tubular interstitial. So, this is acute tubular interstitial nephritis or you can even call it as acute interstitial nephritis. So many evidences in terms of eosinophilia, rash, arthralgia, WBC cause, this is antibiotic induced acute interstitial nephritis. Any antibiotic in this world can produce AIN. We have discussed about cases of AIN with respect to penicillin, we have discussed about case of AIN with respect to rifampicin, case of AIN with respect to diuretics and so many things. Okay, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain and all that. So, this is the most basic ABG you can get. I'll close it. Just do that uh, one module on practice ABGs. So, that practice we have discussed about 20-25 ABGs. That will be enough. Alkalosis is there. Uh, PCO2 has increased. So, respiratory has increased. Bicarbonate has increased. So, metabolic is the one that has increased along the lines of alkalosis. Respiratory has actually increased along the lines of acidosis. So, it's a simple case of metabolic alkalosis. Okay, so that's it. Then a little bit more uh, complex question, can't say complex and all, just have to know how to calculate the anion gap. I have told you about serum anion gap, stool osmolar gap, urine anion gap and all that. So again, no room for any kind of an error. Sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate is what we call as your serum anion gap. Sodium here is 135, chloride is 92 and bicarbonate is 20. So you are having 135 minus 112. So 135 minus 112 is definitely, definitely more than your 8 to 12, which is the normal anion gap. And I've told you about how to adjust anion gap for albumin and all that. So, this is a case of high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Simple. Correct. Then I have even told you about what are the cause of high normal. When you get normal, how do you calculate delta ratio and delta ratio, what does it indicate, etc, etc. Not going into the two basic questions. Uh, serum potassium is 2.8. So, what do you do? What do you not get in hypokalemia is what they have asked. So, like hypokalemia, polymorphic BT, torsadi point is everybody knows. Hypokalemia, quadriplexis, quadriplegia, again everybody knows. Hypokalemia and uh, diabetes insipidus, told you this so many, many times. Hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, the two metabolic abnormalities that can cause nephrogenic DI. Cerebral edema is all about hyponatremia. It's not about hypokalemia. Hypokalemia is nothing to do with the brain. And I have even told you like which are the abnormalities where you can't get a seizure. That's primarily because of the reason that potassium abnormalities are not prone to produce those things. So again, very basic question. Please be sure with potassium, calcium, sodium because they keep on asking questions with respect to this. All are true with respect to RT except. RT is again one of our favorite topics, right? So type 2 is loss of bicarbonate, correct? Type 2 is proximal RT. In proximal RT, what is the problem? Proximal RT is a net defect in your bicarbonate reabsorption which happens at the level of the PCD. So it's 100% right. Uh, now, type 2 is fanconi and hypophosphatemic rickettsia. Yeah, there are so many salient features of type 2, right? Because it is a generalized dysfunction of the PCT. PCT handles so many things. Most importantly, it handles whom? It handles phosphorus, yes, because it's handled only by the PCT and you lose phosphorus to get rickets. So that's called fanconi syndrome. Type 4 is because of aldosterone insufficiency or aldosterone resistance. You can actually put it in either way. Now we call both as type 4. Aldosterone resistance is the most commonest type of type 4. Yes. And what does type 4 lead on to? It leads on to hyperkalemia and hyperkalemia with acidosis. So all the 3, 1, 2 and 4, no there is no type 3 RTA. Type 1, type 2, type 4 can all produce normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. 1 and 2 are associated with hypokalemia and 4 is associated with hyperkalemia and I have given you all the details with respect to 1, 2 and 4. Again one of my personal favorite topics this is. So defective ammonia genesis is what man? Hypokalemia will always stimulate ammonia synthesis. That is why you get hepatic encephalopathy when the patient is on diuretics or when the patient vomits correct. So hyperkalemia will suppress. So even if you don't know that it is okay. Type 4 comes with paradoxical aciduria and hypokalemia. Even if you don't know paradoxical aciduria, still you know that hyperkalemia is seen in type 4. So you can obviously rule it out. And paradoxical aciduria is what we talk with respect to hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. That is not kidney. It is in the stomach. So that is not the area to talk about. We have nothing called paradoxical aciduria here. Here it is expected to be a urine pH which is on the higher side. Urine pH is high because what does renal tubular acidosis mean? Tubule is not working because of which H plus ion is not secreted into the lumen because of which you are basically having what? Acidosis. What acidosis? Metabolic acidosis. So your H plus is not being secreted into the lumen. When H plus is not being secreted into the lumen, can you acidify your urine? Obviously you cannot. So what will happen to your urine pH classically described in type 1 RT? It is going to be more than 5.5. Type 2 RT because the distal machinery is intact, you are going to have a normal pH. Again, all these details we have discussed. So don't call it as a tough question. If your basics are right and you know the basics, you are never going to err here. Add on physiology question, erythropoietin is produced by 
erythropoietin is uh, predominantly produced by the kidney we've discussed now peritubular interstitial cells of the uh, renal cortex what we call as the peritubular interstitial fibroblasts they are the ones who produce epo and very clearly it is mentioned that there is some degree of epo production from the perisinusoidal cells in anemia of ckd we have mentioned this because uh, this erythropoietin is in the fetal life produced a lot from the liver and infancy also produced a lot from the liver but later on it changes into the kidney and this has been discussed by Krishna Kumar also. Thrombopoietin on the other hand is predominantly produced from the liver. So actually here the answer is both liver and kidney but the main source is always kidney. Which of the following conditions may lead to a decrease in GFR? Again just trying to test out your physiology knowledge never forget this equation. This equation is what they have tried to test out here. It is a difference between your net hydrostatic pressure and your net oncotic pressure. Your net hydrostatic pressure is your capillary hydrostatic pressure and your Bowman space hydrostatic pressure. Net oncotic pressure is your again Bowman space hydrostatic Bowman space oncotic pressure and your capillary oncotic pressure. So that is basically what it is. So what decreases the GFR means? Again, glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, when it increases, your GFR increases. When it decreases, your GFR decreases. So, this value is 60 millimeters of mercury. Then you are having your Bowman space hydrostatic pressure. Bowman space hydrostatic pressure is 18 millimeters of mercury. 32 is your uh, capillary oncotic pressure and this is negligible. That's why your net filtration, ultra filtration pressure is equal to 10 millimeters of mercury which is 60 minus 18 minus 32 which into your ultra filtration coefficient which is your 12.5 ml per minute per mm mercury. So this 12.5 ml per minute per mm mercury into 10 comes to 125 ml per minute. You can actually watch my module on renal physiology. So obviously your glomerular capillary oncotic pressure decreases means that you are basically going to have a increase in GFR. Increase in glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure means again you are going to have an increase in GFR. Increase in Bowman space hydrostatic pressure means that you are going to have a decrease in GFR. So Bowman space hydrostatic pressure increase is basically the reason for a decrease. This is again a straight pick from diabetic kidney disease. As far as diabetic kidney disease is concerned, the most important priority of the treating doctor is to somehow bring the proteinuria under control. The most important drug to bring proteinuria under control is ACE inhibitors. If it is not controlled with ACE inhibitors, the next option is aldosterone antagonist. Among the aldosterone antagonist and SDLT2 inhibitors, among the aldosterone antagonist in the past we were using steroidal drugs like your spironolactone and epirenone. Now we have got this new drug on the block which is aldosterone antagonist which is non-steroidal. Hence a lot of you and cry about this drug and as far as DKD is concerned, this is one very very important drug. So SDLT2 inhibitor, ACE inhibitors or ARBs and aldosterone antagonist are the three drugs which can prevent progressive kidney damage in a patient with diabetes. Hydrochlorothiazide has nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do. Again, that's what I'm saying. This question may seem a little tough for somebody who is studying just with theory and may have to recollect it from the videos. But for somebody who is sitting in the OP or for somebody who is just managing a few patients at the ward, somebody who is doing his internship properly, all these questions, majority, I'm not saying all the questions, majority of the questions are cake core questions. Now again, with respect to this, we have discussed this so many number of times and Anjan sir has also discussed this so many number of times. Correct matching, again, we have discussed almost all these things. So thiazide diuretics, PCT wrong, osmotic diuretics, DCT wrong, carbonic anion trace is right and potassium sparing diuretics, collect conduct is right. Okay, so that's about nephrology. Again, as far as nephrology questions are concerned, I think this is the only one which I feel some people got a little like kind of caught off guard because again they are not used to seeing patients. If you are not used to seeing patients, you will be very thorough with the video. If you are very thorough with the video, also you will not miss this. And the other questions are pretty much straightforward. Hematology, we are having few questions here. Which of the following about Hodgkin's lymphoma is not true? One module we have solely dedicated for Hodgkin's disease and I told you almost everything about Hodgkin's disease. Nodular sclerosis is the most common type worldwide and seen uh, in males more than females. But among females, this is the most common one. It presents with mediastinal masks and of course it presents with uh, superior vena caval obstruction syndrome, everything we've seen. R cells are typically B cells. That's why we have talked about that now. Under B cell development in germinal center, yes. R cells are positive for CD30 and Pax5. Yes, CD15, CD30, Pax5. Again discussed. Waldazering is the most common site to be involved. No, and Waldazering involvement in Hodgkin as such is very rare. Waldaze etc. is more involved in non-Hodgkin. Again, we have discussed this. And as you can see over here, no, the other adenopathy groups in non-Hodgkin, almost anything can be there. Adenopathy groups here are generally the cervical lymphodes and nothing else much. So, Valdez ring and Vicentric node rarely involved, commonly involved. Extra nodal disease is again more common for non-Hodgkin's. Not a growth promoting oncology. TJ beta, TJ beta, TJ beta. Somebody who has heard the video while sleeping also will be knowing. TJ beta is not at all growth promoting. Fibrosis, fibrosis, fibrosis. Everything else is growth factor.
hemophilia um, what can be transfused of course cryo is something which you can't because cryo is basically got factor 8 it has got something like one will brand factor it has got fibrinogen so you have a hemophilia b here so you can use ffp you can use cryo poor plasma cryo poor means anything other than cryo so the option here was b and d okay myelodysplastic syndrome median age of onset 70 years elderly disease so many times discussed radiation use so many times discussed treatment induced mds is not dependent on age here it's dependent on the drug and mds is more commonly seen in females this is what i told you so many number of times mds is more commonly seen in males 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 females in india have a particular type of mds that is very very prone among females in india and that is called the 5q deletion mds where lenalidomide is of use and that is predominantly seen in females 40 to 50 years. That's what I'm saying. It's in the younger age category. The originally described MDS is much, much more commonly seen in males. Okay. So again, please. So we have discussed the three main chapters. I hope all of you got all these questions right. I will pardon you if you've got uh, that metformin question wrong and maybe progression in diabetic kidney disease wrong. All the other questions I expect everybody to everybody to get right. Cardiology INI focus is always on ECGs. Let's see the ECG questions this time around. This is a patient who comes with chest pain and everything. And V1 or you can say V2, V3, there is a ST depression. I think if you remember that one statement I told you in the ECG class, that one single statement, you'll be able to answer this question. What is that statement? Non-ST elevation, okay, non-ST elevation has no localizing value. When you're having ST elevation in V1 to V4, you call it as androseptalem. I agree completely. When you're having ST depression in V1 to V4, can you call it as androseptalem enstemy? Your professor will kick you. It's absolutely wrong. There it has got no localizing value. When you're having ST depression in a localizing pattern, you think that that is a reciprocal change for a ST elevation somewhere else. So that somewhere else ST elevation, we can't find out here because we are having only 12 leads here. This is a clear case of post my No doubt about it. There is nothing called anterior wall enstemy. There is enstemy. Enstemy can be having diffuse, no particular pattern, nothing like that. Okay. And now, even if you want to answer enstemy, where is drop? I told you there is nothing called unstable angina in today's world. There is only something called NST elevation ACS and ST elevation ACS. To say NST elevation ACS, you need to have drop. There is no drop. Okay, so simple post all I don't confuse, okay. A man was brought to the emergency department unconscious and hypotensive. So whatever we eat, it is synchronized DC cardioversion. So you don't have to think about anything else because it is unconscious hypotensive. Nothing more, nothing less. Female patient presence of dyspnea and palpitation. Uh, and so this is the question on AFib, okay? And AFib question, there is a bit of a confusion here because should be treated with cardioversion in all cases, everybody knows is wrong. Is never a finding in a morphologically normal heart. Is the arrhythmia in a morphologically normal heart? Now, these are the two confusing options. IV digoxin to control heart rate. Uh, even cardiologists, I am not using an IV digoxin now. I don't remember using IV digoxin as a PG. I remember using oral digoxin, okay? Very much oral digoxin. In Madras Medical College, they were using, I think, IVD oxygen for a few patients. So, again, guideline is, is it recommended in today's era, today's age? It is not recommended. Are people using? Yes, still people are using. Oral more, IV very less. Difference in pulse rate and heart rate is a reliable clinical sign. No. Pulse rate, heart rate, pulse effect deficit is a clinical sign, but is it reliable? Can you diagnose anything based on that? No. Because even in flutter, even in so many of the other arrhythmias also, you can get it. So, I feel this is definitely not a reliable. The word reliable is mentioned, it is not reliable. Is it a clinical sign? Means yes, it is a clinical sign. So, you must read the question carefully and accordingly answer. Treat it with IV digoxin to control ventricular rate, if you ask me, is a right option. Because although used very rarely, still it is a right option. Nobody can say it's wrong. Difference in pulse rate and heart rate is clinical sign means right option. Reliable clinical sign means wrong option. So read and accordingly come to a consensus. This is again a confusing question, but like I'm not sure what is the exact option. From what I feel, these are the four options. And from there, the answer is this one. Female came with fever for one month, now presence with chest pain, breathlessness, and all. You know this question. Now, pericarditis, pericardial effusion, tamponade. Pericarditis going to effusion, then going to tamponade. And of course, loudest when it's got nothing to do with this. Pulses paradoxes may be seen in tamponade 100%. Emergency pericardial synthesis for tamponade 100%. Echo showing diastolic collapse, RV diastolic collapse. Again, classical finding. I've told this so many number of times. Most common cause for pericardial pericarditis is post viral pericarditis. Correct. And post viral pericarditis can have associated simple effusion. That is part and parcel. But when that is impairing feeling and is causing a diastolic problem, you call it as a tamponade. And tamponade can have all these findings. Okay, miscellaneous questions on Kursakov psychosis, which many people were actually kind of um, fighting it out, I think, soon after the exam. Wernicke's encephalopathy is characterized by, uh, all of you know, no, right? global confusion of thermoplegia and ataxia. 
Corsacoff psychosis is generally seen in the recovery phase of Wernicke and if you treat properly, most of the time will not occur. Corsacoff psychosis is typically characterized by confabulation and very severe degrees of both andrograde and retrograde amnesia. So, confabulation and amnesia are the two correct answers here. Polyneuropathy is not a picture of Corsakov. Ophthalmoplegy is not a picture of Corsakov. So, if you are given an option A and B, that is the best answer. Now, should you mark A, B, D in this, A, B, C in this or A, B, C, D in this? If you think that the patient is already having Wernicke, because majority cases of Corsakov are seen in people who are having Wernicke, and Wernicke is almost 90-95% time associated with the patient who has neuropathy in uh, alcohol. That is why most of the time we call it as a go and Wernicke. Go and Wernicke or GOA, Goa Wernicke. But as a PG, you mostly study go and Wernicke. That means global confusion of thermopathy attacks a neuropathy. So, Korsakoff is generally seen in the recovery phase of Wernicke. Okay. Or generally seen in people who are already having Wernicke. Not to be seen without Wernicke. So, ideally, if the option was say B and a, then I would have marked that, but there is no option like that as per the student. So then of course you can mark ABCD only, nothing else. If you are going to mark polyneuropathy correct, then you should mark what of thermology also correct. You cannot say other way. Right. Upper motor neuron, everything we have discussed, it is A and B here and the option was also A and B. A patient presents with anaphylaxis, which of the following is not a part of the clinical criteria to diagnose anaphylaxis. So, urticary and everything you know, V's and respiratory distress you know, uh, it is definitely not hypertension anaphylaxis, it is always hypotension anaphylaxis. Abdominal cramps and vomiting, when I got this option first time, I was also thinking uh, anaphylaxis, like we don't see abdominal cramps and vomiting. So, then I went and checked into the criteria because anaphylaxis is not something I teach routinely. But I always knew it's not there and when I checked the criteria, of course, it is not there. So, cramps, vomiting, hypertension are actually speaking not there. So, C and D is the correct option in that question. Something we discussed straight away, whenever you are having infective endocarditis due to enterococci, which is allergic to penicillin, the answer is vancomycin. You give actually vancogenda competition. You can actually see it in the notes and you can see it in the description on infective endocarditis. Fifth day, what do you do? They are trying to catch you off guard again. People who worked in the ward will know, right? See, first four days, NS1 is positive, but then, then there is a phase where this IgM is taking off. IgM really becomes positive from day 6 onwards or maybe after the 5th day or the end of 120 hours. But every time after 80 to 85 hours, there is a chance of getting IgM positivity. It is only those percentages that change. So on the 5th day, if you want to do something, it is definitely, definitely IgM. Nothing more, nothing less. What is uh, not a worrisome feature? We have done a module on dangerous headache, if you remember. One particular module on dangerous headache, where I told you anybody having increased intracranial tension is dangerous headache. And you have to check with your fundoscope and look for papilledema. And that's very, very important. GC also, very much. So, tenderness over the temporal area, I think they mean GCA, which is definitely dangerous because it can lead to loss of vision. Subacute worsening is one of the prima facie features. Subacute worsening, nighttime awakening, vomiting, vomiting, relieving the headache. Uh, very nuanced headache, uh, age more than 50 years, all this. History of cocaine abuse is nowhere mentioned. Cocaine, in fact, is a vasoconstrictor. Vasoconstrictor might actually relieve the headache, God knows. But it's never a part of this. If you know the other three options, you, of course, you will be able to figure it out. In comparison to ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease association with all of you should get this, right? Crohn's and ulcerative are all our very favorite, favorite, close to heart, close to heart topic. So, Crohn's disease associated with less likely to present with daily hematochesia. Yeah, because hematochesia is because of a problem in the rectum. Crohn's can involve anywhere from the oral cavity to anal canal, but generally ileum or jejunoiditis. So, because of that, hematochesia is a proctitis issue and proctitis is seen with ulcerative colitis. Perianal fistula is more for Crohn's because of transmural involvement. Increased risk of developing cancer, I told you very clearly that the risk is equal for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Non blood mean non-colonic malignancies are even associated with Crohn's. Continuous lesions uh, than segmented lesions, never. It's almost always continuous lesions in ulcerative colitis and segmented lesions of Crohn's. This is the other tough question, which again, I am not sure about the answer. What is the indication for steroid in IgA vasculitis? That is a new name for HSP. And in my video, I have made it very clear that arthralgy and abdominal pain are the two indications to give steroid only in severe cases. The skin rash as well as the renal involvement doesn't respond to steroid in a child. So, you can write arthritis in this, you can write GI bleed in this, you can write pain abdomen in this. All these entities, if severe, we give the patient steroid. So, then what to mark? Um, obviously, that's up to your level, only you can think that way. All these three things you can mark. But if you're asking me the best possible answer, arthritis generally very much responds to NSH. But I haven't taught this in class. So, 
uh, arthritis is something where steroid use is like 1% or 2%. Pain abdomen they use maybe like 3 to 5% because again some of the abdominal pain which is not going away with routine medication you may use steroid. But GI bleed most often they say is like you have to use steroid if it does happen. But have I seen a patient with HSP developing GI bleed I have not seen. From Palmo so it's very sad that you're not having any representation for pulmonology instead of having taught pulmonology quite a lot. This is a case of OSAs. So OSAs is something which we discussed in detail and everybody knows about OSAs and the late time somnolence and all that. Apnea, of course, awakening, of course, locks in stimulation. So basically due to loss of your pharyngeal muscle tone. So never an increase in tone. It's loss of your tone that leads to OSAs. Only one question from there. These are the questions that I could actually assimilate. If you dig deep, there are, I think, a few more questions. One question on lactulose in encephalopathy, angulosic spondylitis is one straightforward question. So those are the ones. But overall, if you see, every question has a bit of a twist here and there. But are the genuinely tough questions means no, there are only very few genuinely tough questions, four or five questions, maybe metformin question, hard to answer, bipedal edema, little hard to answer, or maybe the question on steroids in HSP, little tough to answer. Apart from that, if you have the sense, I think you should be able to. So finally, what is the take home? Every INICT, especially me, has a lot of surprises in store. It tends to be a bouncer sometimes, it tends to be fully theory sometimes. This time around, it's exactly the way I want it. That means easy, very superficial, but twists here and there. Just to find out who is smart in executing and who is the smarter uh, person with respect to the exam hall presence of mind. Number is generally not like that. It's going to be straightforward and more or less a continuation from May. So if you if you follow the core areas, you should be able to. As far as the major subjects are concerned, again I repeat, again and again I repeat, endocrine, nephrology, hematology. These are the three areas that you have to keep focusing, focusing, focusing. Other chapters, even superficial knowledge will take you through. Along with this, ECG and ABG is generally part of your scheme of things. That's essentially how the INI spans out. Must watch areas, these are the must watch areas. Inside endocrine, pituitary, adrenal, bone, pituitary, adrenal, bone. I can repeat, again, repeat, again, repeat. As far as nephrology is concerned, glomerulus, glomerulus, glomerulus. As far as chemistry is concerned, leukemias, lymphomas, leukemias, lymphomas. And even most of the time with pathology knowledge, you are able to answer those questions. And ECG and ABG, not in so much of detail, but basic ECG, ABG. But for people who are doing their MBBS, who are actually seeing this right now, suppose somehow you come to see this right now, or if you are an intern and you want to tell something to an MBBS student, please Please start your preparation early. Please start your preparation early because you're not having any stress when you're watching the videos in third year. You're not having any, I mean, say, any cutoff or any time limit where you have to stop watching or where you have to finish watching. You can basically carry on. You can take that extra time. You can relax and watch. You can sleep and watch. So that naturally, without your knowledge, some of the things just get into your system. So that does keep you in very good state. So don't wait for an internship to get over and then start preparation. Then it starts becoming a bit of a Herculean ask or a bit of a mountainous ask. So, as I am doing this video, the results for INICT are also out. And as you can see, majority of the students who have done well in INICT are freshers rather than repeaters. So, once again, uh, people who are in their MBBS, please don't waste time. Uh, whatever be the fate of your MBBS course, whatever whatever way it spans out to be, if you're not happy with your college, you're not happy with the degree of uh, uh, exposure that you're getting, you have a PG course to compensate for that. So, let's make it big. Let's make it count. Meet around the corner, what to say? Um, I'm very poor with advices. So as usual, I'm not anyone to advise you. I'm not anyone to tell you to make a plan for the next 30 days, sit on top of the book, sit on top of the table and jump and all that. Uh, we are not any Superman, Spider-Man or He-Man. So whatever you've been doing till now, just try to do justice to your preparation so far. Revise as much as you can. If you feel execution is the issue, then please do a lot more questions. And uh, be sure with your notes and be sure with the soul of the topic. That's what I always tell you. If you are asking me, do I remember everything about multiple sclerosis now? Do I remember everything about eye stenosis now? No. But the soul is always there with me. I know that there is a pressure gradient, there is a gradient issue. LV is pumping against this iota, I mean against this stenosed iota. It is having to increase its pressure. So that basic soul is always there. But once you lose that, then you're almost like kind of mugging up everything. So try to cut short mugging up, try to get into the soul of the topic. And as you near the exam, once you know the soul, then the facts you can just like that mug up. Very quickly you can mug up. And elimination is always the key to success. So please, please do keep that in mind. Whatever said and done, ultimately what is going to come to your rescue is elimination skills. And finally, take it as an exam only. It's just a ticket to get into the next part of our course or next part of our training. Our training can be probably divided into three parts, you know, MBBS, that's a UG, BG, and then of course your super speciality for subjects which have a DM or MCH. And this is the second part of our training. Even if the first part has been a failure, even if the first part has been a disappointment, we always have the chance to come back with the second part. That's of course very important. And it's 
equally important for us to understand that this is our opportunity to come back into the limelight or come into the limelight. So you can be part of some good team. So there are a lot of good things waiting for you after the exam. Provided uh, you, you do the exam well and you make good decisions also. All those things are actually very, very important here. So once again, wishing you the very best for the upcoming NEET exam. And this is a video I expect you to see more like before the November uh, 24 INI because May and November generally tends to mirror one another. So once again, wishing you the very best for your exams. And any queries with respect to the answers that we have discussed, uh, please do let us know because to the best of my ability, I have tried to compile the question and seen to actually what are the options. So these are the options available to us. And within that, we have tried to discuss. So once again, thanking you. All the best.